Uh, okay, everyone. So, uh, shall we carry on? Uh, yeah, yeah, excellent. Uh, day two, beginning now. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yesterday we were just having a look at some of the background material. Uh, and this background material is just really to establish how perceptions arise uh, and how we can deal with them for. Uh, for the future, and, and also the significance of uh, the development of right view and the development of perceptions. Uh, these things are very closely related to each other, uh, and they are powerful supports for the practice. Uh, and uh, I always, you know, people sometimes think, you know, how should I spend my day? What is the right way for a Buddhist? Uh, and very often what we are told is that we should be mindful. Yeah, be mindful of everything you do. Be mindful when you eat. Be mindful when you wash the dishes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's good to be mindful, of course. I, I'm not, you know, not suggesting it's not good. It's, it is useful, uh, but it should also be applied for a particular purpose. Uh, we should know why we are mindful. Uh, mindfulness on its own doesn't really do all that much. Uh, it always has a certain aim. And uh, one of the first aims of mindfulness, as I mentioned yesterday, is to make sure that we live well. Yeah, we are aware of our mind states. Uh, we uh, adjust our mind states to make sure that we have positive and wholesome qualities. That's kind of number one purpose for mindfulness. Uh, another purpose I mentioned yesterday is for meditation purposes. Uh, yeah, so when you sit down and you want to watch the breath or whatever, mindfulness obviously is fundamental for that kind of situation. Uh, uh, but mindfulness can also be a help in daily life to change our perceptions about things. Yeah? You are aware of what's happening around you, and you can kind of... Uh, uh, attune your mind to those things and then kind of see things through the lens of the Dhamma, so to speak. Yeah. And this is what the idea of changing perceptions is about, uh, changing our views, having right view, seeing everything through the lens, uh, the prism of the suttas, uh, understanding the world in that way. Uh. And when you start to understand the world through the perspective of the suttas, uh, and something kind of amazing happens. Uh, and what happens is everything that you come across in your life uh, becomes potentially a teaching. Uh, everything you come across is like, how do I understand this in the right way? And then actually everything shapes you as a person and you become much more attuned to the Dhamma as a consequence of that. Uh, so this is kind of uh, what this is about. Yeah? So these things, like in daily life, you can use the perception of anicca, a perception of death, these kind of things you can use all along uh, to sort of to, uh, keep the mind in a, in a good state and actually improve the qualities of the mind. Uh, there's one quick sutta, which I mentioned already yesterday very briefly. This is the Vipalasa Sutta, Anguttara 4 is 49. Uh, translated is as perversions, uh, uh, or if you like, distortions is another way of thinking about the word vipalasa. And uh, just quickly go through this also by way of background. Uh, and so the um, idea behind the sutta is that our mind is uh, essentially distorted. Uh, yeah? It has a distortion and we are born with these distortions uh, and they're very deeply embedded in us. The reason we are born as human beings is because we have these distortions in the first place. Uh, we didn't have them, we wouldn't be here. And so they're very deeply embedded in us uh, in the sense that uh, they have been there for you know, lifetimes after lifetime after lifetime, uh, maybe for eons. Uh, uh, and because they are very deeply embedded, uh, the only way we're going to overcome them is by challenging them uh, and by trying to kind of straighten out our mind uh, and seeing things according to the, uh, uh, the Buddha's teachings, if you like. Yeah. So it is... Uh, it is kind of, um, uh, it takes commitment, uh, it takes perseverance to sort these things out, uh, and you have to do it again and again and again. Uh, but then as you do it, things start to change, uh, and you're kind of, the momentum is heading in a different direction. Uh, your super tanker uh, yeah, is heading in a different direction. Uh, I think that super tanker is in that little book. Has some of you got that little book that's called Flowing to Freedom. Uh, yeah, the super, if you want to know more about the super tanker, you've got to get that book. Right? I'm not going to, I'm deliberately not going to tell it so that you have to. <laughs> no, I'm being very naughty. Well, uh, the idea of the super tanker, yeah, which I actually do mention in there, is this idea that our minds and our lives have a very strong momentum from the past, uh, very strong habits. Uh, and these very strong habits tend to lead us down in the same direction. 
And the idea is it's like, like a super tanker. You know, the super tankers is enormous ships, yeah, and they can weigh up to half a million tons. They are just ridiculously large. Uh, and I've actually been on some of those ships, and they're just enormous uh, 20 meters across, 30 meters deep, 500 meters long, or something like that. Absolutely. And uh, once they, it's amazing, they can actually reach fairly high speeds, like 20 knots or something. Yeah, these large super tankers, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, uh, but once they reach that speed, uh, it's very hard to turn around. Yeah, they kind of continue, even if you put the propeller and the, the rudder in a different direction, it takes a long, long time to change course uh, because of the weight of the ship. Uh, and so our minds are a bit like super tankers. Uh, yeah, so you have to treat your super tanker with kindness and care and compassion uh, because you know it takes a long time for the super tanker to turn around. Uh, so be kind to the super tanker. Okay, nice super tanker. I will look after you. And then if you're kind to your super tanker and then you keep on reconditioning it, uh, eventually, yeah, one degree after one degree it will turn around. Uh, and eventually it will come all the way around because it's just a matter of time. Even a super tanker eventually has to change course if you keep on pushing it in one direction. The problem is that we push it a bit, bit in that direction and then we push it a bit back again. Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, we kind of try to have metta and then we get a bit angry and like, oh no, I just destroyed all that metta I was building up. <laughs> then you had to try again. It's like two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes one step forward, two steps back. <laughs> and that's the one you want to avoid, right? Because that's a really bad one. And so a lot of this comes out in this teaching on the vipalasas, on the distortions of the mind. So let's have a quick look and see what the Buddha has to say about this. Mendicants, there are these four perversions of perception, mind, and view. Huh? What for? Yeah, so this is what I was saying yesterday about the perceptions. I said thoughts yesterday, and the Pali word is chitta. Chitta usually means mind, but it also includes things like the thinking aspect of the mind. So often thinking is a good translation for chitta as well, huh? depending a bit on context. Uh, sanya, chitta, and ditti are the three Pali words behind this. Uh, uh, so these are just three aspects of mind. Yeah, they in reality they are hard to really separate 100 percent They kind of overlap and they work on each other. But uh, perception is more like the immediate thing. Yeah, you see something, just like we saw in the sutta before. From those perceptions, you think about those perceptions. So thinking and mind is a bit more advanced than perception. And then based on that, we build up our views, our vision of reality, our vision of the world. Uh, yeah, so when you ask someone, what is your view? Say, I believe in rebirth. Yeah, that's a view, right? That is not a, and you may also have that perception, but that is a view when you ask someone what they believe. Uh, are you, you know, are you eternalist or are you an annihilationist or are you a cessationist? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I, some of you may, may not understand what I was talking about just there. <laughs> so in, in, in the Buddhist teaching, there's the, the typically wrong views are eternalism and annihilationism, right? These are the typically wrong views in Buddhism. And what was the Buddha if he was not uh, an eternalist or an uh, annihilationist? Well, he, one way of putting it is he was a cessationist. Uh, yeah? That's what uh, kind of the, the right view is in Buddhism. So uh, we can discuss that more later on. It's the wrong time to get into cessation right now. <laughs> Extinctionist, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, anyway, whatever. <laughs> okay, so let's move on then. So these uh, three, these four perversions or distortions of the mind, perception and views, what are they? Number one is taking impermanence as permanence. Uh, yeah, so you, things are, according to the Buddha, things are impermanent in the world, uh, things are unreliable, things are uncertain, uh, but we have a tendency to see them as much more reliable than they actually are. Uh, and uh, how do you know that you're taking something to be permanent? What exactly does it mean? And it doesn't mean necessarily that you think things are going to last forever. Yeah, if I ask you about yourself, and I ask, well, are you going to die? You say, you pro presumably you say you're going to die, yeah? You don't think you're going to be permanent in that sense. Uh, I don't know. Anyone think, here thinks you're going to be permanent, last forever? No, probably not, right? Uh, 
we, we recognize that we all have to end in death. That's just, you know, it's kind of bleeding obvious. So, so it doesn't mean that, that we kind of take it in that way. What it means rather is that we are not really ready to die now. That's what it means, yeah? We don't understand the degree of impermanence. We don't understand how unreliable things actually are. We expect to be around for, how long do you expect to be around for anyone here? Still there, you have an expectation there, yeah? Timur is <laughs> okay. Wow, he's very wise. He's kind of <laughs> he has got it. But most people think, yeah, okay. How old am I? I'm sixty. Yeah, most people get at least to seventy-five. They so got another fifteen years. Yeah, actually, I made good karma. So probably more like eighty. Yeah, maybe okay. eighty-five. Yeah, in my case, that's how we tend to think, right? And if we and if someone dies when they're young, we think it is against nature. You hear these people say this all that. Oh no, in in my case. Uh, my, uh, my father passed away about three years ago. My sister passed away shortly afterwards. Uh, and when my sister got sick with cancer, my father said, oh, no, this is kind of against nature. This is the worst thing. The child is not supposed to die before the parent, right? Uh, but why not? Uh, why shouldn't the child die before the parent? Uh, of course, normally it is not the case, but occasionally it will be the case. It is not against nature. Uh, it is just more rare. That's really all uh, and so we don't really grasp fully the idea of impermanence. And this is really what this is about here. So it's understanding this. Every time you say, oh, no, something has gone wrong, it means that you haven't really grasped fully the idea of anicca, of unreliability and uncertainty. It is one of the things about to grasp some of these concepts. Sometimes we have to rephrase how we talk about them, yeah, how we think about them. And to me, a word like impermanence doesn't really have very powerful kind of emotional impact. When I think impermanence, like, yeah, yeah, impermanence, things come and they go, yeah, big deal. Of course, we all know that. It doesn't really, okay, doesn't, but if I say unreliable, yeah, that has to me much more emotional impact. Unreliable, what do you mean unreliable? Because unreliability is exactly what we try to avoid in this world. If you're having an unreliable friend, it's really bad news, right? Uh, or having an unreliable job or whatever. Everything that is unreliable is terrible. We don't want that. Uh, and of course, the truth is that everything in life ultimately is unreliable. So this is kind of a nice way of thinking about the idea of, of Anicca. And one of the kind of beautiful things I learned from Ajahn Brahm, and I've probably said this many times before, but I will say it again. Uh, he said that when you want to learn the Pali language uh, and you want to understand the concepts that you find in Pali, uh, one of the best places to look for meaning is the Vinaya Pitika. The Vinaya is the monk's rules and regulations. Uh, because in the Vinaya, these are regulations that deal with ordinary life, with regular, regular life. These are the kind of ordinary things that we deal with. And you find words that are not used in a profound philosophical or spiritual context, but used in an everyday context. And that everyday context gives you much more access to the meaning than the elevated philosophical context. And then from that ordinary everyday meaning, then you can actually deduce what the more profound philosophical meaning actually is. Yeah? We should always start with the concrete meaning, and from the concrete meaning, move on to the abstract and the more uh, uh, elevated meaning. Yeah? It's from the concrete that we come to understand what words actually mean. Yeah? And in the Vinaya Pitaka, a word like Nietzsche means something that is regular. Yeah? Something like you have a Nietzsche butter, butter means meal. Yeah? You have that word in Malay, butter, for, for rice or meal, yeah? but. But uh, don't have that. Uh, okay. Is it bread, is it? Uh, brick. What, okay, that's not quite, <laughs> quite right then. Okay. <laughs> so that doesn't work. But in India or Sri Lanka, if you go to uh, Sri Lanka, for example, they have uh, what they call kiribat. Kiribat is rice milk. Yeah, rice is butter. So it means meal. So it also means meal because rice and meal are, in India is almost the same thing. Yeah, if you have rice, you have a meal. If you have a meal, you have rice. So it's almost. Uh, goes together. So you have something called nicha butter. And nicha butter means a regular meal. Yeah, you go to the house every week to someone and they give you a meal every week or every month or whatever. This is regular, yeah, or reliable. So impermanent means irregular, yeah? not unreliable, yeah, profoundly problematic in other words. Yeah? So and then uh, impermanence starts to get a bit more scary. Yeah? It should be a little bit scary, yeah? impermanence, yeah. 
It should be like, wow, I've got to get my act together. If you feel, whoa, I've got to get my act together, then impermanence is working right. Yeah? So that's kind of how you should feel. This is actually a bit worrying. Yeah? And I will talk much more about this perception of impermanence later on because uh, it is a very important one. Uh, and you will be surprised at, at how important the Buddha makes this particular perception, the uh, Anicca Sanya. And uh, so we get back to that to it later on. But this is the idea. We don't really fully grasp it. We think of things as more permanent uh, than they actually are. Uh, it doesn't mean that we think of them as absolutely permanent, but more permanent. Uh, and this is... Uh, is obviously a problem here. Taking suffering as happiness. Yeah. This is kind of really, uh, really important and really interesting. Yeah. Uh, there are so many things in the world that we think are happiness, which actually are suffering from a Buddhist point of view. Yeah. And uh, so that, this is kind of, uh, this is very challenging yeah, because uh, in the end, the Buddha says that pretty much everything is suffering at the end of the day. Yeah. And that's kind of really goes against the grain. Even happy feelings are suffering from the higher point of view. That's kind of hard to grasp. And so this is very challenging. And of course, when you start to see this, when you start to understand what it means, it helps you to let go. It means meditation becomes possible because you don't hold on to suffering, you let it go. So understanding suffering has a very powerful impact on our spiritual practice and the spiritual path. Yeah? You let go more of the world. You're taking what actually is suffering, you take it to be happiness. Yeah? One of the classic examples, of course, is uh, the sensory world in general. The sensory world is very, because it is very impermanent, very unreliable, it also becomes suffering. So there's a very close linkage between these various kinds of distortions, because we think of things as more permanent than they are. That is also why we think of things as more happy than they actually are. Yeah? There's a link from impermanence going to suffering, and then from suffering going to non-self. These things are related to each other, these various distortions of the mind. So we tend to take suffering as happiness. That's a problem, right? Yeah, this is a big problem. And you can see why the Buddha's teaching is so, so challenging for us, because we, we have think, got things upside down, basically. That's the problem. Uh, there's a beautiful saying that Ajahn Brahm always likes to point out, and he, you know, he, he, he hasn't mentioned this for a while now. I, sh I should actually remind him of some of his nice sayings that he has not saying, has said for a while. Uh, and this is the saying that what the noble ones uh, take to be happiness, the ordinary people take to be suffering, uh, and what the noble ones take to be suffering, the ordinary people take to be happiness. Yeah? And so in other words, we get things upside down. Yeah? And this is, uh, this is very fascinating. Taking not self as self. Yeah? Taking some aspect inside of you as self. Yeah? If I ask you, do you exist? You probably say yes. And uh, if you say no, then... Uh, <laughs> You probably don't need to be here if you say no. Uh, so, yeah, so we feel that we exist in a certain way. But if I ask you exactly what is it in you that exists, uh, yeah, does, is, is the body, is that really permanent? Is that the real you? You probably say, no, the body is kind of okay. You have it for a while, then it goes. Uh, what about your perceptions? Yeah, maybe some of those perceptions, but not all of them. Yeah, so you kind of narrow it down. And sometimes we just have this general feeling that we exist in some way without really. Uh, pinpointing exactly what it is. And then the Buddha, he comes around and he analyzes the human person, the human personality. And this is one of the reasons why he analyzes it into the five khandhas, the five aspects of personality. He does that to be able us to pinpoint more clearly where it is that we have the sense of self, yeah? where actually it arises, where it comes uh, into existence, uh, how, we, um, uh, how it is that we have that in relation to what things, etc. So, uh, yeah, so we take what is not self as self. And of course, that leads to a lot of grief because that means that your sense of self will get challenged eventually. Eventually, you're going to have to give up things that you take to be yours and that you, especially when it comes to ownership, but also the very sense of self, uh, deep-rooted sense of self will eventually be challenged. And that's very painful because this is uh, so close to us as human beings. Yeah? This is me. This is I. 
Yeah, this is the real me. Oh, maybe not. Oh, no. What now? Something like that. Uh, yeah, dukkha, basically. Yeah. So impermanence. From impermanence comes the idea of suffering. Yeah, yeah. dukkha, anicca, uh, anicca, dukkha, sanya. Perceiving suffering in what is impermanent. Anicca, dukkha, sanya. And then dukkha, anatta, sanya. Perceiving non-self in what is suffering. Yeah. These are standard perceptions in the suttas. So. Taking ugliness as beauty. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, the asuba, seeing suba in what is actually asuba. And uh, one of the most uh, important asuba perceptions in the Buddhism is the perception uh, of the body. The 31 parts of the body is kind of one of those perceptions that we use. Uh, so... Uh, yeah. Anyway, let's become, maybe come back to that later on, the idea of ugliness uh, or non-beauty non might be a better way of putting it. Uh. So uh, these are the four perversions of uh, perception, mind, and view. There are these four corrections of perceptions. Corrections, okay. Perception, mind, and view. What for? Uh, taking impermanence as impermanence. Uh. Taking suffering as suffering, yeah. Taking not self as not self. Uh. Taking ugliness as ugliness. Uh. So uh, this is the correct view. Uh. And uh, to gain these correct views, uh, we have to reflect again and again. Uh. We have to look at the world, what it actually is like. Uh. And we have to try to see it in line with how the Buddha saw it. Uh. And uh, this is incredibly important. Yeah, this is really, really matters. Uh. Because if we are deluded about the way the world is, uh, we are not going to be able to make good decisions. Uh, good decisions ar arise out of good information. Uh, we have to see things according to reality. Otherwise, we're going to make bad decisions. Uh, that is true for everything in life. Yeah? Everything in life, you need reliable information to be able to make good decisions. Uh, it's kind of bleeding obvious when you think about it. Uh, yeah? And uh, so uh, if I want to come to KL, I have to take the flight that goes to KL. I take the flight that goes to Bangkok, I won't get to KL, right? I need good information about which flights. Uh, that's the easy information to come by. It's not very difficult, but still you need the right information. Otherwise, what happens if I end up in Bangkok, then Dukkha. Dukkha for me, because I you know, got to come to Bangkok, I come to the airport, no one knows me. Actually, in Bangkok, very easy. If you're in Bangkok, it's not so hard. But if I go to, like, um, uh, I don't know, maybe Beijing, maybe more difficult, right? Or I go to... Uh, Moscow, yeah, the people look at you and they say, what are you doing here? You... <laughs> are you, you, maybe you're a spy from Ukraine, probably. Yeah? <laughs> they might say, I don't know what they will say. Yeah. So if you get, get information wrong, you have a problem. Yeah? And this is far more important uh, on the spiritual path than in ordinary life. Yeah? Spiritual path is about the meaning of life, for goodness sake. Yeah? The spiritual path is about uh, happiness in the deepest sense. Uh, the spiritual path is about everything that really matters. If you make a mistake on the stock market because you have bad information about the companies, okay, you lose some money, but it's not a big deal. It doesn't kind of destroy the meaning of life. But this here is about the fundamental aspect of what life is really about. It matters enormously that we see things right. And here we know, if we follow the word of the Buddha, we know that our perceptions are wrong. We know that we have delusions. We know that we don't really understand things properly. And so because we know that, we know there is work to be done. And this is the work, these four things, this is where the work is to be done. Yeah? And then I'm, I'm saying that you cannot make good decisions unless you have good information. Well, that is what Samaditi leading to Samma Sankappa is all about. Samma Sankappa is good decisions, really. Sankappa means intentions or choices or... Um, uh, purpose or goals, yeah, where we're heading. We want to make good choices about where we're going. Uh, those good choices come from right view. Uh, without right view, we make bad choices. Uh, and then, of course, those good choices then lead us to becoming moral. It leads us to purify the mind. It leads us to becoming mindful and all of these kind of things. Uh, so it has tremendous uh, positive effects down the line. Uh. So this is the idea of um, four kinds of uh, fixing up our perception, views, and uh, thoughts. And uh, so we will see what the Buddha has to say about this, and then we will 
try to act accordingly. These are the four corrections of perception, mind, and view. So this is the background information. And now we're going to start on the actual perceptions. Yeah? What kind of perceptions that we are, how to correct our perceptions. And I'm going to start with one of my favorite suttas, which I've talked, mentioned very, very often. This is the Arya Pariyasana Sutta. Uh, which means the Sutta of the Noble Search, uh, Majjhima Nikaya 26. Uh, it's a marvelous and beautiful Sutta. That's what I think anyway, so you can see what you think. Yeah. And uh, we're going to look at this in a bit of detail. And this is one of these beautiful suttas where the Buddha talks about his own life before his awakening uh, and tells us what he did uh, to reach awakening. Uh, and one of the things he did was to challenge certain perceptions uh, and develop certain ways of thinking about the world. Uh. But uh, before we get into that, uh, let's uh, do a little bit more uh, meditation together, do some questions, and then we'll come back to the sutta shortly. Okay, so... Um, do we have any uh, comments or questions from anyone? Uh, anyone want to say anything? Uh, oh, people are taking out their hats, getting getting cold. <laughs> is it? Is it? We, is the aircon too cold? Are you sure it's okay? Yeah. All right. Okay. Good. Yeah. Please. Uh, good morning, Ajahn. Good morning. Um, I I was wondering. Um, yesterday, um, you mentioned that when we develop the mind, then we can correct our perceptions and you've uh, reminded us again this morning. And you also said that we are active participants in this world. Mm. But I, I'm trying to understand, then how do we practice acceptance that there are certain things that we can't change, that the world is... is um, um, the world has its imperfections, therefore we should take refuge in the Dharma, yeah. practice acceptance, but at the same time have the courage to change and correct um, our perceptions and then wisdom to know the difference. Okay, <laughs> okay, I see, it. yeah. All right, that's the quoting, it's a famous, uh, famous saying by who said that? Uh, uh, this idea of knowing what you can change and uh, knowing what you cannot change, but the wisdom to change. Yeah, there's someone, some kind of wise person said that, or semi-wise person or whatever. Anyway, um, so the, the idea of acceptance is itself a kind of a right perception. Yeah? So you actually need to change your perception to be able to accept things. Uh, that is already a change of perception right there, because often we don't accept things. Uh, and so one of those acceptances is precisely accepting that the world is impermanent. Uh, so you accept that the world is out of control. Right? You accept that the world doesn't really work according as you, as you wish it to be. And as you accept that, uh, your mind turns a little bit away from the world because it makes the world less interesting. Yeah? So acceptance is not just a passive thing and then it doesn't have any effect. If it is real acceptance of these truths, uh, it actually has an effect on your mind. And the effect is that you turn a little bit away from the world and more onto the spiritual path because you understand the world is much less interesting than maybe you thought it was initially. Uh, we will never get those things out of the world uh, that we often think we will get out of the world. Uh. So uh, this is uh, kind of the idea of uh, acceptance together with, uh, with, a certain, uh, with a certain attitude that arrives at the same time when you change your change where you take your refuge, etc., etc. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And the wisdom to know the difference? Well, you, you grow slowly, slowly, you build it up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you said you wanted to ask a question yesterday, didn't you? We forgot about you yesterday. So this is now is your chance to. Uh, ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. Morning, Ajahn. <clears throat> Thank you for remembering. <laughs> okay, I have two questions one for yesterday's and now another one for today. So yesterday, you um, from page at page seven, right, second paragraph, it says here, eye consciousness arises dependent on the eye and sight, mm. and the meeting of the three is contact. And you went further to elaborate that without attention, 
this happening will not be known. Mm -hmm. Now, this attention, right, I wish um, to seek Ajahn clarification. Is it one of the universal seven under the 52 mental factors? Or this attention is deliberately doing by the mind, now that we got this information, mm. intellectual understanding. Mm. So I understand that to go, mm. to have further understanding, deeper understanding into the ultimate reality, it needs discernment. And from there, when uh, condition matures, uh, wisdom arises, you need wisdom behind. It's not a doing thing. Mm. So this attention, right, if it's yeah. not being understood correctly, it is a deliberate doing by this very conditioned mind because yeah. this mind is super conditions, do, 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 yeah. do, do. Yeah. We always understand that there's no free lunch, yeah. that kind of thing. So I, I seek Ajahn's clarification on this point. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. So you have to study Ab Abhidhamma at the 30th. <laughs> okay. okay, so that's good. So you can now you can use your Abhidhamma novels in a good way. That's, that's great. Uh, so yes, the attention is, uh, the attention can be different things. It can be automatic, depends yeah. that is conditioned. Uh, and you kind of attend almost automatically without, that's usually the case. Yeah, usually when you hear things or you see things, it doesn't feel like you are trying to see it or hear it just kind of happens. Uh, but there is a chaper now, there is an intention behind it. Uh, there is a will, the mind is kind of moving towards that. So there's a kind of will. Uh, uh, so, but that intention can be more or less deliberate. Uh, yeah? So a lot of the time we are automatic and when we are automatic, our defilements have a kind of free reign, uh, yeah, because the defilements are just kind of working through the mind uh, and uh, we don't really counter them because it's all automatic. Yeah. But so part of the idea of mindfulness is to have more, uh, more uh, control over your attention. Uh, so you can attend to those things that you want to attend to and you don't attend to those things you don't want to attend to. Uh, and this is in part of what Yoni Somanasikara is about. If you go to the uh, 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 Sabhasava Sutta, Majjhimala Camp number two, it defines uh, Yoni Somanasikara, which can be translated as wise attention, yeah, or something like that. Uh, and that means that you attend to those, one of the definitions in there is that you attend to those things you want to attend to, and you don't attend to those things you don't want to attend to. So you have more control of your mind there. So this is like the one step. Yeah, this is how you use mindfulness. Uh, but the idea here is like deeper. The idea here is to recondition the entire attention. Uh, so that even when you attend automatically without mindfulness, the attention tends to go in the right direction because you have reconditioned uh, that, uh, that attention. It has, you have reprogrammed it. Uh, another program says go this way. Yeah? So the, your robot inside goes in the right direction. Yeah? We're all a bit like robots. Yeah? We kind of have this automat automaticity about us. Uh, that's part one uh, Part two. You said you had a second question. Yeah. yeah. I thought you had part two. No, 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 that's for you. Yeah. Okay, my second yeah. question is uh, this morning's uh, sessions where you say, you know, as a lay practitioner, yeah. we ignorantly take suffering as happiness, mm -hmm. as pleasure. Very simple things that, you know, when we wake up in the morning, we want to eat chak We want to what? Eat certain mm -hmm. noodles. Videos. <laughs> Ah, great yeah, yeah, Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, we were, to us, right, taking the car key, getting to the car, driving all the way there, even in heavy rain, we will still go there. Mm -hmm. We're going by, come back, we eat. To us, it's not suffering. <laughs> yeah. Simple yeah. things like yeah. that. Even yeah. we, we enjoy cooking. Yeah. We will go all the way to buy all the ingredients, cook, 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 and then halfway we find we miss one ingredient, very critical one, we we'll still go out and buy. Yeah. We don't find all those things suffering, but all those <laughs> things are attachments to sensual yeah. pleasure. Yeah. So yeah. is there any way that Ajahn could, you know, give some pointers to us? Okay. How to be more mindful? Those are actually not, not, you know, not happiness, not that kind of ultimate realities, yeah. joy, but it's suffering is attachment to sensual pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the, the problem is that we don't have anything else. Yeah? We don't have any alternatives. Uh, and so we go for the best thing that we have. Uh, and so compared to the alternative, uh, yeah, compared to not having nice food, uh, having good food is happiness compared to that. So it's a relative happiness. Uh, and so we go for what is relatively happy. Uh, and uh, often, uh, so this is one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is just the enjoyment of doing. Yeah, you made, It's nice to cook a nice meal, right? It's the enjoyment of cooking a nice meal and having other people share that, you know. There's a certain kind of, a, that activity itself has a positive feel. And that is in part, that is because we identify with being doers. Uh, 
I am the doer in, in the world, I am the creator, I create a nice meal, or I create a nice something, yeah? That creativity is an enjoyment in its own right. Uh, so this is kind of from an ordinary point of view. And so the idea, one of the points of the Buddhist path is to actually kind of elevate yourself a little bit out of that view uh, and actually see that actually it is not as great as you think it is. Uh, and from a higher point of view, all of these things, all of this activity, all of this doing, <laughs> yeah. all of these kind of sensual pleasures that we enjoy in the world, actually they're not, they're actually bad, yeah? Why? Because they're full of activity, they're full of restlessness, uh, they're full of agitation, they're full of running around, uh, and it's very easy to get upset very quickly if something gets in your way, right? Uh, or something doesn't go right, you get upset very quickly. Uh, and so, it, actually, it is much, much less interesting than you think it is. Uh, that is number one, but actually it's much worse than that. That is only number one point. Uh, the second point is, and this is where it gets really problematic, is that uh, one of the main reasons why we have suffering in life, like big suffering, like grief and depression and sadness and sorrow and all of these kind of things is because of the five sense world. All of those things exist in the five sense world. This is the world where these things are. If you go to a higher realm like the Brahma Loka, whatever, you don't have these things anymore. The body doesn't get sick. You don't get old. Yeah. And when you die, it's like, well, yeah, just go to sleep and bang, you're kind of, it's, it's not an issue. And other people die, well, you are happy anyway. It doesn't really matter. Yeah? So this is all in the human realm. So this human realm with the five senses is deeply problematic because it has so much suffering baked into it because of its impermanent, because of unreliability. And the more you enjoy the cooking, the more you enjoy all these little things in life, the more you tie yourself to that realm, which is inherently problematic. Yeah, you tie yourself to these things. So it's not just the fact that the thing itself is problematic from a higher point of view, but you're actually building a bonds to a reality that is inherently problematic. Yeah? That is really, really the big part of the problem. Yeah? And, uh, you know, I'm sure everyone here has gone, has had times in their life when you have felt deep suffering, yeah, deep grief and deep problems. Uh, this is all unavoidable in the human realm. That is a very uh, big part of it. Uh, and then we have done this so many times before. How many times do you want to go through this? Uh, yeah, how many kind of, this is, this is why rebirth is so problematic. Okay, I can deal with it maybe one life, but after doing the same thing a thousand times, a million times, it becomes unbearable. You can imagine someone like the Buddha actually seeing what is going on. For the Buddha, that seemed to have been necessary to reach awakening, because seeing non-self is very, very difficult unless you have a teacher. But seeing this kind of horror show of kind of rebirth, uh, would have turned them away completely, and that enables them enlightenment to happen. Uh, something like that. Uh, yeah. Please. Has, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Buddhist terminology, I think the by the three terms, the citta, mano, and ceto. Mm. Uh, I think in this the uh, sutta, I think the word citta with palaso is used. So I wonder why is it no mano or ceto? Why is it citta? Why is it citta and not mano and ceto? Huh? And what's the difference between ceto? What, what is ceto? You have yeah. the ceto vimuti. Is there a citta vimuti or mano vimuti? Uh, okay, so uh, ceto and citta are very, very closely related to each other. They're almost the same word. So uh, sometimes the difference between these words is just that uh, uh, it, when you use things in compounds, ceto vimuti is a compound word. Eh? Ceto vimuti. So when you have compound you usually use a slightly different form of the same, same word uh, because of this compounded. Uh, so ceto and citta are essentially the same thing. Uh, mano is a little bit, uh, is a little bit different. It also, again, it depends on context. In some contexts, it actually is the same thing. Uh, so for example, you have in the Brahmajava Sutta, the first Sutta of the Diga Nikaya, you have, it says that this thing that is called citta, mano, vinyana, yeah, this thing which is called citto, or mano or vinyana. In other words, it is used as a synonym to refer to the mind. Just like in English, you can say mind and consciousness are effectively synonymous in some contexts. In other contexts, they may be used slightly differently. And so mano is used in the sense of, uh, when you talk about the six sense spaces, the sixth sense is mano, mano vinyana, yeah, mano. So it is used to distinguish the mind from the other senses. Uh, whereas citta is like an is like the mind overall. So uh, even the other five senses are experienced through the citta in a certain way, yeah? because the citta is what kind of takes in the consciousness 
all consciousness is part of the chitta in a broader sense. So, so chitta is like a is like a um, is more like a kind of overall idea of mind, uh, whereas mano is like the specific mental faculty separated from the other five faculties, uh, if you like. Uh, and then vijnana is uh, the is knowing aspect of the mind uh, specifically. Uh, something like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but it's a, it's like things are quite complicated, and the, you know the only way to really know these things fully is to do a PhD thesis. Yeah, <laughs> in the end, that's the only way, and you have to study these words and look at all the contexts and see how they relate to each other. Yeah? And people do this. There was a, a PhD thesis done not so long ago about uh, ditti. What does ditti exactly mean, and uh, what does it mean that you, you know, it talks in the suttas about. Uh, uh, about giving up views. What does it mean to give up views? Does it mean you have no views? Or does it mean you don't attach to views? What exactly does it mean? And, uh, you know, so these things kind of, and usually what happens is you go through, you write a PhD thesis, uh, and then you go to the commentary, and it's, ah, oh, the commentary was right all along. Okay, so the commentary had it already. That's very often what happens. Uh, we, I mean, the, the problem with the, uh, the commentaries on the suttas is that they, were written not by the Buddha, but by later generations. And often we don't know who the commentators were, so they may, may not have been enlightened, and sometimes they may get things wrong. But on the other hand, the commentaries is also the accumulated wisdom of centuries of people who've been practicing the path. So we can generally assume that they will generally have be roughly in the ballpark of what is right. And the chances that we are wrong is much greater than the commentaries being wrong, right? And so very often you write that whole PhD thesis and you realize you can go to the commentary and figure out in five minutes instead. Uh, yeah? So like th those years spent doing a PhD are probably better just sitting on your cushion and uh, closing your eyes. Uh, that's kind of often what it comes down to. Uh. <laughs> anyway. Um, Venerable, do you want to say something? Same thing? Yeah. Yes, uh, the fourth correction of perception. Yeah. Taking ugliness as ugliness. Yeah. What's the Pali term for the ugliness? Asuba. Is it? Mm -hmm. Well, like, is it uh, a super, not a uh, condition? Is it conditioned? Uh, yeah, everything is conditioned. Uh, yeah, a super is conditioned. Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah. If some people might see it's ugly, but uh, some may not. Yeah. Um, so I think the point is that we tend to see things in the, with a bias. Yeah? I think that's the problem. We tend to have very biased minds. Uh, and uh, you know, if, you, if you are an arahant, if you are fully awakened, then you have the ability to see suba in the asuba, asuba in the suba, or going beyond both and seeing kind of equanimity in both. Uh, so the mind can actually change how it perceives everything. Uh, so I think the, the point here is that there are certain aspects uh, of... of you know, um, I agree with you. This one is a little bit more problematic because it is more kind of, uh, uh, it is more um, depending on uh, where you're coming from and the mind can actually change these things around. Uh, but I think the problem is that we tend to be biased in the way we see things. We see things that are beautiful, but actually they're not really be inherently beautiful. And that, as I think, is what it comes down to really here. Yeah. But um, it's a good point that you're making, yeah, that uh, a suba and suba is something that you can change. Yeah? Perceptually, you can kind of change. And even the Arahan can actually change these things around, depending on the certain circumstances. Uh, yeah. So it can really be a correction. <laughs> it is, is there still a correction? Because we, we are biased in a certain way. Yeah? This is kind of the problem. Yeah? And uh, I mean, this is obviously very true with, uh, with, with the body, because the, bod the human body is very, uh, you know, it looks kind of nice on the surface, but you don't need to go far below the surface to kind of see what, what it really looks like. And, and few people would say that the, the organs of the body are beautiful. Okay, they may be functional, they may be neutral, they may not be ugly as such, uh, but you don't really get attracted to them in the same way as you get to a, a real uh, body. Uh. All right. Yeah. I think we have to stop near when we're already going over time. So, uh, um, 